Today, Jesus gives us the look of love, and would you please stand for the gospel lesson, which also serves as our sermon theme. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, Go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words. But Jesus said again, Children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, Who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. Please be seated. What kind of looks do you see a bride on her wedding day? Look at joy, right? A little boy being told No, that's a look of anger. New Yorkers on 9-11, a look of shock. Adolf Hitler posing with his young Nazi lieutenants, look of hate. A mother with her newborn child a look of love. And here is another look of love. The best love of all, the love of Jesus. Jesus looks at you, he looks at me with love. And it is love that tells the truth. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? In addition to being rich, the Gospel of Matthew adds that this, young, that this man was also young. And you throw in respectful of Jesus, sincere in his approach, friendly and outgoing, and this young man was every Jewish mother's dream, Uh, a, a person, a young man that she would love to have as a son or a potential son in law. But sadly, this young man was also confused. He was confused about his own goodness and he was confused about how we get to heaven. And that comes out in what he called Jesus. You notice what he calls Jesus. He addresseth him as good teacher. And in calling Jesus a good teacher, he was selling Jesus short. What does a good teacher do? A good teacher helps his or her students along the way. A good teacher helps the students learn to achieve their goals and become successful. 
And by calling Jesus a good teacher, this young man saw Jesus as someone would help him along his way, help him along the road to heaven. And in selling Jesus short, this young man was also making himself too big. Notice what must I do to inherit eternal life? By making himself the source of having eternal life, we see he was making a mistake. He was confused. And it is a mistake that we see repeated again and again and again. This past Tuesday, I got nabbed by one of Lubbock's men in blue, speeding, got caught by a motorcycle cop, radar, my first ticket, 21 years, crud. Well, on Wednesday, I was going down the exact same road. Lo and behold, there's that same motorcycle cop. This time, I wasn't speeding. I was driving the speed limit. So I pulled over, and I approached him, and he recognized me. And I said and asked him, since I'm driving the speed limit today, would you tear up the ticket from yesterday? And he looked at me, and he said, sure. I'll do that. I think I can do that. I'll do it. And he ripped the ticket up. How many of you think that really happened, right? Lady law does not work that way, and neither does God's law, and yet so many people think that way. We cannot erase the bad we do with the good we do. Our good deeds don't rip up our sins. It just doesn't work that way. Because good is what God demands, and our sins are bad is why we are damned. On our own, we cannot inherit eternal life. Because on our own, we simply are not good. We go on, verses 18 and 19. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. It's a setup. Normally, we think of that in a negative way. Someone trying to set us up to bring us down. Here, Jesus uses a setup, but not in a negative way. Not to bring this young man down, but to lift him up. And the setup that he uses is the second table of the law, commandments four through 10. And the second table of the law says, Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. And a quick review of those commandments, 4 through 10, love the gift of representatives, love the gift of life, love the gift of marriage and family and sex, love the gift of possessions, love the gift of a good name and 9 and 10, Love the gift of contentment. Now listen as he answers. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. His answer reveals a good track record with his neighbors, right? He loved them. He went out of his way to help them. He wouldn't think of hurting them. He was someone who you would love to have as a friend, 
as a co-worker or as a next-door neighbor, but with his look of love, Jesus now hits the nail on the head. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come, follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. The young man didn't have an issue loving his neighbor. His issue wasn't the second table of the law. His issue was the first table of the law, love God more than anyone else. And he didn't do that because he loved himself more than he loved God. You are not going to like this man when I tell you about him, even though he's dead, you won't like him. His name is Jack Welsh. He was at one time one of the most famous CEOs in America. He's still considered one of the best CEOs in America, especially during his time at General General Electric. He lived a lavish lifestyle. He was a terrible womanizer. And because of his lifestyle, he had a heart attack, which required some surgery. And later on in an interview, he was asked what he learned from this health scare. And here's his answer. I learned I didn't spend enough money. So I vowed never again to drink wine that costs less than $100 per bottle. Reaction, what a jerk, right? I told you you wouldn't like him because what did Jack Welsh love? Who did Jack Welsh love more than anyone else? It was himself. This young man had the same problem as Jack Welsh. The only difference is he wasn't a jerk about it. Still, what did he do? He went away sad because he had no intention of giving up his wealth. He went away sad because he loved himself more than he loved Jesus. He went away sad because he had no intention of following Jesus And in walking away from Jesus, he was walking away from the only way to inherit eternal life. And as he walked away sad, there was someone who was even sadder, and that was Jesus. Jesus is still giving us the look of love. He is giving us the look of love. He is looking right at you, and he is looking right at me. It is the same look that he gave to Judas, who betrayed him, to Peter, who denied him, to the disciples, who ran out on him. That's the same look of love that he gives to us. And maybe we haven't betrayed Jesus. Maybe we haven't denied Jesus. Maybe we haven't run out on Jesus. But can any of us ever, ever deny that we've not always put Jesus first, that we have not always loved Jesus, loved God more than anything else, including ourselves? Any of you ever had an ice cream cone at Baskin Robbins 31 Flavors? Ever have a cone there? Baskin Robbins was founded by Irv Robbins, and he founded it along with Bert Baskin. And at one point, Irv Robbins offered his son, John, a mansion. John refused. 
Another time he offered him a very prominent role in the company, but John refused. And at last he offered John his entire inheritance, but John refused. And here's why he refused. His words. There were strings attached. No, there were ropes attached. No, there were chains attached. It was John's way of saying that his father imposed conditions that had to be met and rules that had to be followed. And John either was unable to live that way or unwilling to live that way. We have a father who imposes conditions that have to be met, rules that have to be followed. And if we don't live by them to the letter of the law, we cannot on our own inherit the kingdom of God. God, that, God didn't do that to be harsh. God did that because he had to be fair and because we can't live by them on our own, we cannot inherit eternal life. Let that sink in. Once we get that, and only when we get that, do we understand Jesus' look of love. Love that tells the truth, and now, love that does the impossible. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples were amazed at his words, but Jesus said again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. From the disciples' reaction, you get the impression that maybe they felt Jesus was being a little harsh with this young man, especially as they saw him walk away sad, his self-righteous bubble First, you also get the idea that after they saw this young man walking away sad, they kind of were each asking themselves, wow, if Jesus said this guy couldn't inherit eternal life on his own, what's going to happen to me and my own life with a hilarious illustration, Jesus clearly answers that question. No one. I need a volunteer. Don't be scared. I need a volunteer. If not, I'm going to pick one. I'll pick you, Jack. I don't have a camel. And I don't have a needle. I do have a golf ball. And I have a little ring. And I want you to put the golf ball through the ring or you have to stay in church all day. Try a little harder. You're going to have to stay here all day. This all day? <laughs> you think it's going to work? Okay. <laughs> that golf ball didn't go through the ring. It's impossible. A camel cannot go through the eye of a needle. It's impossible. On our own, we cannot inherit eternal life. It's impossible. Even if our eternal destiny rode on it, thank goodness it doesn't, we can never get to heaven 
on our own. And Jesus hammers home that truth so we don't think of God as some giant teddy bear who just gives us a hug and smiles even though we sin against him in our thoughts, words, and actions. And now comes what we've been waiting for. Now comes the good part. Now comes the grace. What is impossible on our own is possible because of Jesus. The disciples were even more amazed and said to each other, who then can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, with man this is impossible, but not with God. All things are possible with God. There's that look again, the look of love, love which does the impossible because all things are possible with God. Jesus is the camel who went through the eye of the needle. This is grace. This is Jesus' perfect grace. Jesus loved his father perfectly. Jesus loved his neighbor perfectly. Jesus was crucified on the cross to pay for our sins, our guilt, our death, our hell perfectly. The look of love is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The look of love gives us peace with God and the promise of eternal life. The look of God, his, his unconditional love, no restrictions that have to be met, no strings attached. This is this. This cross is Jesus, the camel, going through the eye of the needle. Jesus did the impossible, and he did it for you and for me. And in the end, Jesus is teaching us not to let anything come between him and our treasure in heaven. This silly notion that there is something I can do or that I have to do to try and get eternal life. This worldly notion that the riches of this world and temporal life are more important than the kingdom of Christ and eternal life. Last August, as Marie and I made our move from Denver, Colorado to South Carolina, we spent the night in Springfield, Illinois. And we heard about something that happened in a nearby city to Springfield and it was called Spring Valley, Illinois. And a man arranged a birthday gift for his wife. He had some diamonds and rubies set in a ring which he was going to give to her for her birthday. And to add a finishing touch, he bought some of those helium-filled balloons and he tied the ring to the ribbons on those helium-filled balloons that you see at parties, birthday parties. And then he grabbed it and he put them in the back seat of his car. And he gets home and he opens the back seat, the back door of his car, right? And I think you know where this is going. Poof, up in the air, the things that all material riches do. This is the treasure of heaven. This is the kingdom of Christ. This is the look of love. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus looks at us and he loves us too.
Amen.